Hey everybody and welcome back to episode 38 of the Sunset Single Player Podcast. It's your host, Michael. So after we go into the Bethesda and Microsoft major news items today, I'll be going into my thoughts on Final Fantasy VII Remake. So today, like I said, I really wanna focus in on the Bethesda acquisition, go into the studios that were acquired and what this means mostly for PlayStation players moving forward. And again, we don't know all the facts yet. There's still some unknowns, but I do think it's important to go into what we do already know so far. And hopefully I can fill you guys in on some information that you may have missed in the announcement. Or if you weren't paying attention to the announcement, maybe just give you an idea of what's going on in general. And I will give you my best guesses as to what this means for Sony and PlayStation moving forward. Since as I've stated, that's where I do the vast majority of my playing. And that's where most of my content stems from is the PlayStation 5 at this point. So first things first, let's get into the Bethesda news. So what actually happened is that Microsoft's head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, recently announced that the Microsoft and ZeniMax Bethesda deal is finalized. And as we had previously learned last year, Microsoft acquired ZeniMax, which is the parent company of Bethesda, for the whopping price of $7.5 billion. And I do want to make clear that Not many companies can make an acquisition like this happen, let alone many companies in the video game industry. Microsoft just has a lot of cash. They're a very, very wealthy and strong corporation. And when the deal was announced, there was a lot of speculation behind what this would mean for Bethesda games in regards to exclusivity moving forward. People wondered whether or not these games would be exclusive to Xbox and PC, or if they would still have the potential to move to PlayStation, Switch, and other rival platforms moving forward. And while we don't have all the answers today, like I've said, what we learned is a very clear message surrounding what the overall strategy will be moving forward for these games. But before we get into the details surrounding the exclusivity, I do first want to go into what Microsoft actually bought in terms of what Bethesda owns through its eight different studios. So ZeniMax, the parent company of Bethesda, previously owned the following eight studios. They owned Bethesda Game Studios, id Software, ZeniMax Online Studios, Arcane, Machine Games, Tango Gameworks, Alpha Dog, and Roundhouse Studios to be more exact. And while I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what these studios make, I do first want to clarify for some of you that might not know what each of these studios is most famous for and also what we know each of these studios is working on in the near future. So right off the bat, probably the biggest and the most famous of all of the Bethesda studios is the generically named Bethesda Game Studios. And I believe they're based in Maryland and they're most famous for their flagship Fallout and Elder Scrolls series. So most recently we know they're working on the much anticipated and very mysterious space role-playing game called Starfield. And this game was announced all the way back in E3 or summer of 2018. And we also know that they're early on on in development for Elder Scrolls 6, which is the next title in line after Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim. And I know a lot of people are excited about that. And I do think Bethesda got some criticism in their conference a few years ago for announcing that this game was in development, but literally having nothing to show for it. So I'd imagine that Elder Scrolls 6 is still a ways out and that we would expect Starfield is set to release first before Elder Scrolls 6. And the second studio I wanna talk about, and this is the studio that I actually like the most out of these eight from my own personal preferences and experiences is id software and id software is most famous for their doom series and most recently the excellent doom eternal which was one of my very favorite games of 2020 and if you'd like you can definitely listen to my previous episode 37 which unfortunately is only on audio feeds about my top games of 2020 and my thoughts overall on doom eternal i really liked the combat in the game. I love the flame belch, kind of the over the shoulder device used to get armor. I love the glory kills and I love fighting the marauders, just the really, really intimidating marauders in that game were a lot of fun. And the super shotgun definitely did a lot of work on those guys. So I definitely have a special place in my gaming heart for id software love doom i can't wait to jump into the ancient gods dlc in a little bit and we'll move into that in a little bit further in the episode i'll talk a little bit more about the ancient gods dlc and what that means for playstation as well so next up is zenimax online studios who is most notably regarded for their work on elder scrolls online 
And personally, I'm not really into these large time sinking MMO type games. I know that Elder Scrolls Online has a really big audience and I've heard it's a very quality game. I just haven't jumped into it personally. And we also know that Arcane, which is the fourth studio, is most famous for their Dishonored games and also the game Prey. And they do have the upcoming game Deathloop coming first to PlayStation 5 in mid to late May of this year. I think it's May 21st to be more exact. And we'll get more into that in a bit as well. So this timed exclusivity deal with Sony is interesting and it kind of puts a wrinkle into Microsoft's plans with the acquisition. So we'll definitely go into that. And it is coming day and date to Windows as well. So you can play it on PC and on PlayStation 5 in May. So the fifth studio is Machine Games and they're most well known for Wolfenstein. And I think they're based in Sweden. I could be wrong about that though. And they're most well known for their first person shooter gameplay in the Wolfenstein series of games. And recently we've gotten Wolfenstein 2. I'm imagining they probably have another Wolfenstein in development, although I don't think anything has been said about that, and I should correct that. Wolfenstein Youngblood was the most recent Wolfenstein game, not Wolfenstein 2, and that game was not received as well as the other Wolfenstein games, which is interesting, so we'll have to see if they can rebound with a third mainline Wolfenstein game. And next up is Tango Gameworks, which is the studio famous for the Evil Within series of survival horror games. And they do have the exciting new game Ghostwire Tokyo, which I'm very excited for coming to PlayStation 5 as a timed console exclusive as well. So the exact same situation as Deathloop and coming day and date with Windows as well, but not on Xbox right away. And if what we heard prior is to still be believed, Ghostwire Tokyo is still shooting for an October launch date. And this game looks really, really awesome. It kind of looks to mix like control, kind of this telekinesis based gameplay with infamous, like the kind of launching of projectile gameplay with something like Death Stranding. Death Stranding was a game I really enjoyed with some really unique and terrifying enemy types that I do think kind of looks to make a transition into Ghostwire Tokyo. It seems like they may have borrowed a little bit from Death Stranding in Ghostwire Tokyo. So I'm definitely gonna keep my eye on this one. Hopefully they can hit that October launch date. I do think it would slot in really nicely in October of this year. So two more studios to go, and then we'll get into what this all means and also break down the timed exclusivity pieces that I mentioned earlier for Tango and for Arcane. So the seventh studio that Bethesda owns and now Microsoft owns is AlphaDog. And AlphaDog was acquired first by Bethesda and is known for its Monstro City Rampage and Ninja Golf remake games. I don't know too much about AlphaDog besides that. And then finally, we have Roundhouse, who is previously well known as Human Head Studios. That was their prior name before they changed names to Roundhouse. And we did learn prior that their game Prey 2 was actually canceled. And we don't know what they're working on now at this point in time. So now at this point, we've gotten into the what. Let's get into the what does it all mean. So this past week, Microsoft essentially clarified that moving forward, its main focus is for Bethesda games to be offered on Xbox Game Pass compatible devices. So far, of course, we know this includes Xbox consoles like Xbox One, Xbox Series S, Xbox Series X, and PC. And this at first glance would indicate that Bethesda games will not be coming to Nintendo or PlayStation consoles moving forward, and they will stay exclusive to Xbox and PC. But with this being said, there is a little bit more to it than this. So Microsoft also clarified that they do not want to abandon their fan bases on other platforms for games that have already been released. So a great example of this would be Doom Eternal. And Doom Eternal is actually set to get a trailer this week. And they clarified that it's actually going to be coming on March 17th at this point for The Ancient Gods Part 2, which is its most recent expansion, and I believe final expansion. So The Ancient Gods Part 1 was released in October of 2020, following the main game's initial release in March 2020 for Doom Eternal. I didn't get to this game until a little bit later. I think I played it in like May of 2020 on base PS4. And this game, of course, was also released on Xbox consoles and PS4 at the same time since the acquisition for Bethesda was not yet underway. And Doom Eternal also released on Nintendo Switch in December of 2020. And again, I do really highly recommend this game. It is one of the best first-person shooters I've ever played. It's up there with Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. 
for me personally. So with this tidbit that they don't want to abandon their fan bases on existing platforms for games that the games have already been released for, I would imagine that the Ancient Gods Part 2 will of course be coming to non-Xbox consoles, which is great, and it wouldn't make sense for them at this point to abandon that since the Ancient Gods Part 1 is already available on PlayStation. I actually saw it on the store the other day and was considering picking it up, and I am really excited to play through both Ancient Gods DLC packs later this year once the the PS5 update is released for the game, which is awesome. And it's interesting because I think the game, I actually read online that the game ran at 4K and 60 frames on PS4 Pro, which is already kind of next-gen specs. I could be wrong about that though. So I don't even really know how much of a proper PS5 upgrade the game will even need. Maybe they'll just focus in on reducing the loading times and maybe adding some haptic feedback or some adaptive trigger type of action, just some nice bells and whistles to enhance the experience a little bit. We'll just have to wait and see. But I do think it's great that Microsoft in this kind of interstitial transitionary period is not abandoning PlayStation players and they're supporting the expansions on PlayStation and allowing me or someone like me to play these games and these expansions without having to get an Xbox or a PC with Xbox Game Pass. So with this being said, I also imagine that any future updates to Elder Scrolls Online and Fallout 76 will also be coming to non-Xbox consoles, and in this case, more specifically, PlayStation. I know that both of these games have really strong fan bases and presumably very strong fan bases on PlayStation. I'm not sure if Elder Scrolls Online is available on Switch. Uh, I would have to check on that. But either way, it does make sense that these types of games that have already been released won't just stop their support now that the acquisition is underway. That would definitely bother a lot of people in that type of situation. So before we get into kind of this legacy or contractual obligation situation that I want to get into. So basically what this is going to entail is that even games that haven't been released yet might still come to PlayStation or non-Xbox Game Pass platforms because of contractual obligations or legacy type of situations, they said in the conference. But where it also does get interesting is that there are timed console exclusivity deals, like I previously mentioned on PlayStation 5 for Arcane's Deathloop coming in May to Sony's console first, and then also Tango Gameworks' Ghostwire Tokyo coming in October, presumably, to PS5 first. And we still don't know the nature or the, or the length of this timed console exclusivity period. It could be a six-month timed exclusivity window. It could be a 12-month, similar to what we saw with Final Fantasy VII Remake. I believe that game is due out on Xbox in about a month or so, about a year after or 12 months after it came to PS4 initially. So it might be one of those types of deals. They just haven't really clarified yet when these Bethesda games will be coming to Xbox platforms. But like I mentioned, the games are also coming day and date to Windows. So you can also play them there on PC in addition to playing them on PS5. So I do think that it was retroactively very smart of Sony to have paid in the past a lump sum, presumably, or I'm assuming it was a lump sum payment for each game in order to get these timed deals of console exclusivity for the PS5. And this was presumably before they knew that Microsoft was making a run at acquiring Bethesda and these studios collectively. So I do think it makes a whole lot of sense. And it was also smart on their part because besides Oddworld and Returnal and Ratchet and Clank coming, there's really not too much out on the console this year and out so far. I mean, Miles Morales and Demon's Souls were both incredible launch titles, but since then, there really hasn't been much in terms of PS5 games to play. And at this point, I'm honestly spending most of my time replaying great PS4 games or trying new PS4 games on the PS5 just because there aren't a lot of native PS5 games available right now in the early stages. So I do think it was smart of them and they were kind of ahead of the game to want to get these two games in a timed console exclusivity type of agreement. So maybe they thought, oh, 2021 is looking a little bit light besides a few of these PlayStation games. It would be great to lock down one year or six month exclusivity deals, whatever it might be for Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo, which are both looking to be high quality games, at least in my eyes and my perspective, actually did work out for Microsoft too. So even though you can't play the games on Xbox when they launch in May for Deathloop and October for Ghostwire Tokyo, respectively, they will in turn be getting a sizable cut, Microsoft will be, of the revenue for the sales on PlayStation 5. 
presumably 30% now that they own Bethesda and Bethesda is publishing these two titles. So even though these two games are developed by teams that Microsoft now owns, they won't even be on Xbox right away, Where which is where things get a little bit complicated and confusing and a little bit weird, to be honest. So now that we know that this is still the case, we're left to speculate at this future Game Pass focus that Microsoft has in mind for Bethesda. So as we know, all first party Microsoft games are released day and date and are free, and I say that in quotes, with a monthly Xbox Game Pass subscription, which even I have to admit as a PlayStation player is fantastic value, what they're doing over there with Game Pass. The fact that you can play Ori and the Will of the Wisps day one just with a subscription, and that's actually what I did. That was one of my favorite games of last year. I played it on my brother's Xbox, even though I don't own my Xbox Yet, getting that first month of Game Pass for like a buck and playing that game and then just $15 a month from here on out after that is fantastic. And it's great because on PlayStation, when I buy Returnal on April 30th and Ratchet and & Clank on June 11th, I'm going to have to pay $70 a pop. But on Game Pass, you pay $180 per year and you can play not only every Xbox exclusive that launches day and date, but also just a vast array of other titles that really spark up the value of this service. And that ultimately is probably going to be what gets me to buy into Xbox later on in the generation once their more heavy hitting single player games are ready to go. Because I do feel like in the past, Microsoft's focus was more so on multiplayer games like Halo and Ge Gears of War. But now it seems like we're going to be getting these great single player RPGs like Avowed and the new Fable game looks fantastic. That first trailer blew me away and Halo Infinite's even looking pretty good. I do think that the new screenshots they recently released are looking really good. And then Perfect Dark, that new trailer, that new Xbox exclusive game developed by the Initiative Studio, their new first party studio looks amazing as well. So for me, I'm not a huge Bethesda person besides it. I don't really care about this acquisition for me it doesn't really add value that wasn't already there and i know that's not true for a ton of other people that love fallout and elder, elder scrolls but that's just not me personally i was never big into those franchises i really didn't get into single player rpgs until a couple years ago when i played the witcher 3 and horizon zero dawn i traditionally only not only like but i traditionally prefer first person shooters and linear action adventure games and platformers and that's kind of why i've gravitated more to sony in the past i love the uncharted series last of us ghost of tsushima god of war ratchet and clank i love all the sony exclusives so that's why that's where i've been playing the past decade plus but i do know that game pass is only going to be further improved moving forward by this acquisition so it does make the deal even more enticing and might make me even want to try out these next iterations of the bethesda larger rpgs that i did miss out on in the past so again, while we do know that existing Bethesda games on rival platforms will continue to be supported on those platforms, we now know that the main focus moving forward for future Bethesda Studio developed games will be that most of them will stay exclusive to platforms where Xbox Game Pass exists. And of course, like I mentioned, there's going to be exceptions that we don't know about yet. There's going to be games that Microsoft has clarified have contractual obligations or are legacy titles that might be considered for other platforms on a case-by-case -case basis. And when I say other platforms, I mean platforms where Xbox Game Pass does not exist. So for example, we still don't have concrete information on whether or not Starfield and Elder Scrolls VI, the two Bethesda Game Studios' big upcoming games, will be exclusive to Game Pass platforms or not. But I would assume that it would probably be a safe assumption based on Microsoft's wording that Starfield will be exclusive to Game Pass platforms since it's not a legacy type of title and i say that again unless there's a contractual obligation we don't know about where sony got some type of deal to get starfield on its console that we just aren't sure of at this point in time and elder scroll 6 on the other hand i would say that that might be a big game that might actually come to playstation because of the legacy type of situation they might feel over at microsoft that they might tick off a lot of playstation players that loved elder scrolls five skyrim and maybe don't want to make them mad by only making the game available on game pass platforms so with all that being said i know it's a lot of information this does do one major thing and what it does is that it leaves the ball in microsoft's rivals courts so if sony and nintendo really want bethesda games on their platforms then they must let xbox game pass exist on their platforms as well and whenever you think about this hypothetical situation and you think would sony be open to doing this I would guess absolutely not. 
They're definitely trying hard to push their own agenda with PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. I do think Nintendo is another question entirely. I would say that, and I should say, before we get into Nintendo, I do want to mention that I think PlayStation is doing a much better job with PlayStation Plus. In February, we got Control the Ultimate Edition. In March, we got Final Fantasy VII Remake, two very top-notch, very high production value titles. Control Ultimate Edition is a fantastic game. And again, you can check out my video review if you'd like to hear more details about what I think about that game. And they gave us all the DLC as well. The Foundation and AWE both were fantastic. And in April, we're getting Oddworld Soulstorm Day and Date on PS5 for free with PlayStation Plus. So they're definitely upping the value of the service. I think that I was in the past a bit more disappointed with PlayStation Plus, but now I'm really enjoying it and I'm happy to be a customer of it. But anyways, moving into Nintendo, I do think that Nintendo is another question entirely and Microsoft and Nintendo have played nice in the past and previously Xbox exclusive games have come to Switch a little bit later, including the excellent Ori games, both Blind Forest and Will of the Wisps. I actually got introduced to Ori through the Switch. I bought Blind Forest on the Switch and then I loved it and I wanted to play Will of the Wisps on my brother's Xbox. So they definitely captivated me in that way. And then another recent example is they also got the difficult game Cuphead on the Switch as well. And that game is on PlayStation. So maybe I should say that they're playing a little bit nicer than PlayStation than I might have let on. I forgot that that game came to PlayStation. But I would wager that Nintendo might be more willing to play by Microsoft's rules than Sony would be moving forward. Also because Nintendo is kind of doing their own thing. They're not necessarily a rival to Microsoft in the same way that Sony is a rival. Nintendo is more interested in propagating their own exclusive first party games like Legend of Zelda and Mario games and Metroid while also dipping their toes into lower performance versions of multi-platform games. So a good example of that is Apex Legends was just released on Switch. Even though it doesn't run that great, I think it's like 30 frames per second, it's definitely still a viable option for people that maybe don't want a next-gen console or they only play on Nintendo consoles or hardware or maybe they can't afford a next-gen console. I do think that it's smart what Nintendo is doing to kind of get these viable versions of games while not completely great from a performance perspective compared to the other companies they're still definitely playable and fun for people on those platforms so i do think this of course could change in the future when a heavily rumored 4k switch will presumably be released and again it does seem like that's all speculation at this point but I would imagine it is coming, and once it's announced, we'll go more into it on the podcast and recap that in more detail. So once a 4K Nintendo machine is available, I assume the competition might be mixed up at least a little bit. But ultimately, long story short, and just to recap, other than supporting already released games on existing rival platforms, Microsoft's goal for their acquisition of Bethesda is to get the vast majority, if not all, future Bethesda games in development on platforms that allow Xbox Game Pass and they don't care about hardware sales, they just want the Game Pass subscriptions to gain an extremely strong and recurring stream of revenue. They don't care where the Game Pass subscriptions come from. Maybe eventually you'll be able to get Xbox Game Pass on your smart TV or your iPhone or your iPad. But at the end of the day, they just want your 15 bucks a month. And what they're going to do to gain that 15 bucks a month is increase the hell out of the value of Game Pass. They're going to put their Bethesda-owned games on the service. I will admit that I was wrong. So for longtime listeners of the podcast, the audio version of the podcast, I will say that in the past, I was under the impression that they would release all future Bethesda games natively on rival platforms to gain a chunk or about 30% of the total money through publishing revenue, but it turns out that I was definitely wrong about that. So it seems they instead are putting all of their energy and effort into getting as many Game Pass subscriptions as they can, so as to make it as common a household name as Netflix or Hulu. There's still some unknowns. We don't know for sure yet which Bethesda games will be considered contractual obligations to other platforms for consideration on those platforms or legacy games. It does sound like new IPs, at least from my best educated guess, would be more likely to to come to Game Pass only platforms first since they don't have that legacy type of situation. Whereas games like Elder Scrolls might come to PlayStation since they were already very successful and popular on that platform. Overall though, if you're a fan of Bethesda games and only play on PlayStation, you should definitely think about getting an Xbox since it sounds like the majority of these Bethesda games will only be available on platforms where Xbox Game Pass exists, except for legacy games and contractual obligation situations. And I don't know about you guys, but I doubt 
Sony will be willing to budge and put Game Pass on its consoles when it's really trying hard to increase the value of its own services like PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. And for me, like I said, I'm not a huge Bethesda person besides Doom and Doom Eternal. And while I have always been into games, I only really got into longer RPGs after college. Like I mentioned, I think I beat The Witcher 3 when I was like 24 and I loved it. And that isn't to say that I wouldn't be interested in like a Fallout 5 or an Elder Scrolls 6. I just don't have the same type of love or nostalgia for games like Skyrim, Fallout 3, or Fallout New Vegas, as a lot of other people do. And it's definitely enticing to me as a PlayStation player seeing all of these titles being available on Game Pass moving forward, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of unannounced games in the Bethesda puzzle that we don't even know exist yet. But it won't matter to me, though. They already will have my money once Perfect Dark and Fable are out. Those are the two games that are looking to be the ones that will get me to get an Xbox. And like I mentioned, Halo Infinite isn't looking half bad either. I was a little bit worried about that game based on some of the delays and the trailers, but the new screenshots, like I mentioned, you guys should check out for that game. They are looking really, really good. All right, so now that we went into that major Bethesda update, hopefully I explained that clearly for everybody. I do wanna talk a little bit about Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I should have mentioned this at the top, but this will just be my very early impressions. I'm only about three chapters into the game, and I read online that there's 18 chapters of widely varying lengths. I think chapters eight and nine are like three hours long or something like that. And I've never played a Final Fantasy game before, so Final Fantasy VII is the very first one I've ever played, the VII Remake, and I did read that this was a really good place to jump in. And to be honest, now that we're into the next generation of games with really high quality titles running at 4K and 60 frames per second, I'm not very inclined to go back in time and try out games like Final Fantasy VI or Final Fantasy VII, the original. There's only so much time in the day, and I'd rather use my time that I dedicate to games to play more modern titles, at least at this point in time. Maybe in the future I'd go back to that, but I think it has to do with the fact that I just got the PS5 and want to experience just up and better running and performing games. So I'm definitely really thankful that Square Enix has put the time and resources into completely remaking what is regarded as one of the best RPGs of all time and allowing people like myself to come in and experience it for the first time, having never played it before. And I have to say, just a few hours in, I think I'm like three and a half hours in or something like that, so still very early. I will probably have more in-depth final impressions later on. I have to say, I'm extremely impressed with what I've experienced so far, and I'm sure that that could change over time. We'll just have to see, but right off the bat, I'm just very, very amazed with the production value of this game. The cutscenes are very high quality and dynamic, and they make the game look like a great action Japanese movie. The characters are all very stylish and unique. No character looks the same. The opening sequence with the energy reactor in Midgar was fast-paced and adrenaline-inducing. The combat was unique as well. It wasn't just a hack and slash like Devil May Cry or the older God of War games. They really do throw in a turn-based type of element that I really appreciated and was really fun to learn and pretty self-explanatory. It wasn't too difficult. And I will say one complaint I have so far is that you can definitely get into the weeds and the menus with all the materia and like upgrades and all this stuff. I don't really understand that having never played a Final Fantasy VII game before or a Final Fantasy game before in general. And maybe that's something that they'll adjust in the subsequent parts to the remake. So for those of you that don't know, Final Fantasy VII Remake that's out now is apparently only the first section of the game. So it sounds like in the future they will be adding to it in a more substantial way. So obviously we know that Final Fantasy VII Integrated was recently announced coming to PS5 with the Yuffie DLC. Excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that character. I'm not a Final Fantasy fan, but it sounds like we will get larger, more in-depth titles like this first entry to round out the Final Fantasy story in the future, the Final Fantasy VII story, which is great. And with Cloud as the playable protagonist, you do have typical action-like attacks in this game with this sword, but you can also use special abilities like an upward thrust that's really fun, and also a sword charge attack. And there's also magic in the game that you can use that's fantastic. It really varies up the combat in a really positive way for me. 
Cloud so far has a really nicely animated fire attack that does a lot of damage against dogs and also enemies with shields are weak to it too, I believe. I could be wrong about that though. And something I like is that you can even switch to different characters in the middle of combat, which I think is excellent. I don't really like Barrett as a character. He's the one member of Avalanche, kind of the eco-terrorist organization that you join that he's a little bit brash. I'm not crazy about his personality and his dialogue and just what he says. He seems to really hate Cloud too, for some reason in the early going, but he does have a really sick chain gun on his right arm that's a lot of fun for ranged attacks, and he has a really cool magic thunder attack as well, and the game seamlessly moves you back and forth between characters at the press of a button, which is great. You do have to keep in mind your own health and consider the health of members in your party as well as you're moving back and forth, and you can replenish your health through potions, then also replenish your magic bar meter for your more magical attacks. And the game even gave us a really challenging boss fight kind of right off the bat that made me think the game was going to be pretty difficult because it took me like two tries and I'm just playing on normal. And again, I'm like very new to the game, but I died the first time. I was like, wow, this guy's going to be tough. But luckily I had a lot of potions and was able to get through this really big mechanical looking spider kind of mini boss right off the bat at the very beginning of the game that definitely impressed me. And I'm not sure yet how I feel about a lot of these characters, especially Cloud. I think he does kind of seem only in it for the money. He wants to help Avalanche in their attacks against the Shinra mega corporation. And he just wants to make some money. He doesn't really seem like he's super invested in the cause or anything like that. He also is completely oblivious to the advances from the spunky girl in the party, Jesse, which is definitely frustrating to me as the player. And again, I do want to say that I do like a lot of the Avalanche members so far. I think Jesse and Biggs especially are very cool characters that I definitely want to see and learn more about. And the game also has some really sweet flashbacks to an enemy of Cloud in the past that I'm sure a lot of you know who it is, but I don't want to spoil it here yet for those of you that haven't started the game. And the graphics and the art style are very phenomenal. I think the enemy designs are interesting and varied as well. No enemy feels the same in different sections of the game. I love the way the light kind of shines off of Cloud's sword with the HDR on PS5. So even though the PS5 upgrade isn't ready yet, the game still looks phenomenal on the PS5 right now, just the PS4 version from a graphical resolution standpoint, but it does run at 30 frames. So I'm sure once they get that upgraded version out, it'll be really, really great to see that 60 frames a second in Final Fantasy VII Remake. And another thing I wanna to touch on before we go is the soundtrack in this game. I think it did win best soundtrack of 2020, and I can definitely see why. It's just beautiful, powerful orchestral music that just blares at you as you take part in the action and the turn-based, quick, action-based combat. It's really, really fun. I can't wait to keep playing it. I'm going to put in some more time tonight, and I'm sure I'll have a lot more to say about it next week, and maybe I'll even do a review for the channel if there seems to be some demand for that once I'm through with it. And again, I know it'll be a really late review. We'll be getting to it really, really late since I know the game came out like a year ago, but I still want to cover it as I'm really, really enjoying it. And that does lead me into being late to the party for something else as well. Two video ideas I have coming up for the channel are uh, video reviews. So I'm going to call them 2021 video reviews of Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. In this kind of drought where there haven't been a lot of native PS5 games coming out, I've really been enjoying the Bioshock games again. And I just recently beat Bioshock 1 and Bioshock Infinite and uh, Burial at Sea Episode 1. And I still have Burial at Sea Episode 2 for Bioshock Infinite to go into. I think I'm going to kind of switch back and forth between that and Final Fantasy VII Remake before we get Oddworld Soulstorm on April 6th. But yeah, that'll do it for Episode 38, everyone. I know this one is a little bit shorter than normal. Thanks for your understanding as I got some of the kinks worked out with YouTube and video editing. Like I said, I did have to record this entirely again since I accidentally recorded the first one in non-HD. So hopefully you enjoy the high definition today. And again, please remember to subscribe and leave a thumbs up if you found the podcast episode today informative. And remember, I do go live every Tuesday for each episode of the podcast. And I shouldn't say live, but I do release every Tuesday the next episode of each podcast. So look forward next Tuesday for episode 39 
And I definitely do want to give you guys the option of listening to the audio only version or the new video version that I plan on keeping up if you would like. I want to give you guys that option. So please be patient with the quality as well. I'm sure it'll only improve over time as I get better at video editing. It is new to me. So please leave me a little bit of slack in the comments if you guys don't mind. I also want to say that another game that's coming up I want to cover for the channel before Oddworld and Returnal and Ratchet hit is Blue Fire, which is an action platformer developed by Roby Studios. And it's actually already on Switch and PC, but it sounds like a PS4 and PS5 version should be coming soon, which is awesome. So definitely look forward to my impressions on that game as well. But yeah, just to reiterate, I'm Michael with the Sunset Single Player. Definitely looking forward to catching up with you guys soon. Thanks so much for stopping by and take care.